I've been on a two week staycation, enjoyed my time at home. And for me, the idea of relaxing is getting a project done at my house. And I know that sounds kind of like counterintuitive to most people that when they're on vacation, they want vacation. But if I get a project done at my house, I am so refreshed, I'm so charged up that I wasn't having to write sermons and deal with staff. It's like a beautiful thing. So I was off for two weeks and I rented an excavator to move some boulders around my backyard. And for some reason, heavy machinery and me equals a great sermon idea. Uh, for some reason, when I'm either mowing the lawn or plowing the parking lot, I get sermon ideas. And so that's where today's came from, okay? Excavating and moving rocks in my backyard. I got this idea when I was moving this one boulder that the current state of the U.S., the condition of the U.S., looks a lot like something out of the movie The Purge. Huh? All right? I am in no way admitting to the fact that I possibly could have watched that movie. I'm not saying that I have. I'm just stating what Wikipedia says. Wikipedia states that the movie came out in 2013 and the premise behind the movie is that for one night, 12 hours exactly, you can do whatever you want. That there is no laws that you can't break. Lawlessness is lawful. Unruliness is lawful. Being out of control, murder, hate, whatever you wanna do, you can do for 12 hours and not get in trouble. There's no rules, there's no order to it. Kind of like the presidential debates the other day, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cheap blow, cheap blow, I shouldn't say that. But this, that's what this movie, The Purge, was about. Uh, getting out of you anything hateful that you want to do, get it out of your heart and go do it. And I was, as I was sitting in the excavator, the Lord reminded me that the idea of the purge was actually his idea. It's actually his idea. And he wrote us a bunch of verses in the Bible about getting things out of our hearts, about purging things in our lives. The word purge, ready for this, means, and some of us purge like spring cleaning, where we go through and clean out our closets and we purge our closets. Anyway, the word purge means to clear of guilt, to cause an evacuation, or to make free. To make free, this, is, this word purge means. Okay, so today I wanna go step by step and look at this idea. What is God telling us that needs to be purged? And, and I promise you, he wasn't endorsing the movie either, okay? First Peter 2 verse 1 tells us this. Therefore, comma, therefore, purge yourself of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. He goes on to say now, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. That's what he's saying that you should do. You should crave the things of God so that by it, you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This verse tells us that there is a purge that needs to occur and it's within us. It's within us. Peter writes this letter to the church in Rome to remind them of God's goodness. So in, in great Bible study fashion, let's look at this verse. Let's go back to 1 Peter 2, verse 1. What's the very first word in this scripture? Therefore, therefore, comma. And in good Bible study uh, teaching, anytime there's the word therefore, we need to find out what it's there for. <laughs> right? Very easy. But, but this is how you study the Bible. If there's a therefore, what's it there for? Therefore, is referring to chapter one. Chapter one is telling us how amazing God is, how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he's done for us. And in light of the goodness of God, therefore, do something about it. 
Because God loves you and God cares about you, therefore, do something about what God has done. And he says this, purge yourself of all malice. Now, I don't know if it's because I didn't care or because I really had a hard time with it, but I was not good in English in school. I didn't know what adjectives and verbs and nouns and adjunctions and all this kind of stuff was. I, I did a lot of cheating in English to make it through high school. So when I read a word like malice, it's not part of my everyday language. I don't say, oh, I'm just so full of malice. I, I just don't. So I had to look it up. And the word malice is this, ready? Malice is the desire to inflict injury on another person, to harm them or, su or cause suffering on another, either because of a hostile impulse or a deep-seated meanness. Have you ever met someone who, they're just mean, right? They're just a mean person. That they're probably full of malice. And the Bible says that we need to purge malice. And let me just give you another example of malice. You're in an argument or a disagreement with someone that you love, and instead of arguing the point to bring about resolution, you push one of the hot buttons and just say something to hurt them. That's malice. It's malice, and it's wrong. And the Bible says that it needs to be purged from our lives. Malice could be uh, having a lifelong enemy and then wanting to commit evil or payback against them. This is the person that you say in your mind, I could never forgive them. And what Peter is saying is, because God is so good to you, we need to be good to others. But we can't be good to others until we purge some of this nonsense out of our lives. The second word he says is deceit. He says, get rid of all malice and get rid of all deceit. And deceit is the action or practice of deceiving someone by concealing or misinterpreting the truth. And I'm gonna be honest with you today, man. We don't even know what the truth is in the world today. Like, we do not even know what the truth is in politics. We don't know any of the truth. What story is true? What is not true? And, and we're, we're living and surrounded by deceit. And the Bible says, purge it from your life. Purge it from your life. Get it. Out. He goes on to say, get rid of hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Let me just tell you the word slander there. Slander is, is pretty much what a lot of people do, uh, sitting around the lunch table at work talking bad about their boss. It's a form of gossip, um, and, and it's wrong. It needs to end. He's saying, purge it from your life. It's a lot harder to take this out of you than it is to take it out on someone else. Let me say that again. It's easier, I mean, I mean, let me rephrase it. It's easier to take out your malice or your anger on someone else than it is to take anger out of yourself. Isn't it so easy to take anger out on your little brother or your little sister? They do something. All right, let's just talk about girls. Can I talk about girls for a second? I don't know this firsthand. I just know stories of this where one sister will go into another sister's closet and take her clothes and wear her clothes and not put them back. And then the girl goes and looks for her clothes. I don't know, my wife tells me these stories. And then one sister goes and looks for her clothes and then she's like, where's my favorite shirt? You know, no? And now there's this big fight. Because it's easier to take it out on you than it is to take it out of me. We need to learn how to deal with the ailments of the flesh. P 
Peter's not the only one in the Bible to tell us that we need to deal with ourselves. He's not the only one who tells us that we need to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves, right? (laughs) Paul also writes to us, he writes a letter to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 4.31, he says, purge yourself or get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. How? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgives you. So Paul takes it up a notch. Paul doesn't just point out the problems that Peter points out. He also then adds, okay, you gotta get this out and then give this away. What you need to give is forgiveness. You need to give forgiveness. Give forgiveness. And it's a whole lot easier written than done giving forgiveness, especially if the thing that needs to be forgiven hurt really, really bad. Isn't it? But also the church at Colossae needed to hear the same message. In Colossians 3 verse 8, Paul writes, but now, but now, Therefore, but now, in light of God's goodness, rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. He says, listen, man, you need to stop cussing. You need to stop cussing, man. Get those bad words off your mouth. It ain't gonna benefit nothing. Do not lie to each other since you have taken, watch this, since you have taken off the old self, and its practices and put on a new self. You've taken off the old, you've put on the new, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. So our lives as a believer, as a Christian, should be growing and maturing and being renewed every single day. Paul tells us to purge the old stuff and put on the new stuff. I really hope here in the next few weeks, people still aren't wearing shorts and tank tops out and about when it was 30 degrees this morning, right? There was ice, I had to scrape my windshield this morning. There's gotta be some time where we stop wearing the old and we put on the new season, okay? And this is what he's telling us here. And here's what I've realized that we've done as believers in Jesus. And hear me to the end of this because this is gonna be the most controversial part of my message, okay? This, this next thing I'm about to say is what has got me kicked out of a lot of other church rooms and conversations. It's a, it's a major doctrinal difference that I have with most of the church world because most of the church world just bugs me. They just bother me, okay? Most of the church world, I feel they, they just need somebody to blame So it's either they're blaming God or the devil. Instead of taking personal, personal, not blame, but personal responsibility for decisions. Here's what I've seen Christians do. We have been taught or we want to believe that now that I'm a Christian, there's nothing that I need to do. I gave my life to Christ, ready? And God is in control And so since God is in control, I can just do whatever I want with my life. Okay, let's just talk about God is in control. This is the topic right here. God is in control. That's got me kicked out of so many rooms. God is not in control of the third cheeseburger you had at dinner last night. God was not in control that you said you were on a diet, but then you had a banana split. After God's not in control of that. God is not in control of you just went shopping and bought something you could not afford, so you put it on credit card and you're now in debt. God is not in control of that. God is not in control of you not taking your medication. You are in control of all those things. You are in control of the words that come out of your mouth. You are in control of the anger that is in your heart. God is in control of what you give him control over. God is in control 
of what you give him control over. So if you wake up in the morning and you say, Lord, I give you my day. I give you the words that come out of my mouth. Help me, guide me, lead me into all truth. You just gave him an inroad into your life to do those things. But when you never wanna think about him, he says, here I am. I sit at the door and knock. If you'd let me in and be part of your day, I would love to help you out. God is not in control of the fires in California. That is not the judgment of God on California. It's people setting fires. Listen, listen, listen to what I'm saying right now. The fallacy of the Christian life is I give my life to Christ, now God is in control, and I can just do whatever I want to do. And that is not the case. I cannot go speeding at 95 miles an hour down the highway past a police officer and say, well, God's in control. Jesus, take the wheel. (laughs) There is going to be a consequence to that action. I'm going to get a speeding ticket, maybe get my car impounded. Are you getting what I'm saying, guys? Okay. The idea behind it is wrong, and it's led to a misbelief and and a... not being a follower of Jesus. Hold on a second. I gotta do this for a second. Because I'm about to say something. (laughs) I'm about to say something. I just had to do a little walk before I said that, okay? I had to leave and come back. You ready? You gotta get this. Most Christians have not given their life to Christ. Most Christians have given their afterlife to Christ. Woo, hold on. Most Christians have not given their life to Christ. They've given their afterlife. I believe in God for heaven because it'll cost me nothing right now. I believe in God for heaven because I got to believe in something, but I don't give him my today. I'm not gonna give him my current decision. Ooh, come on somebody, let this settle in. I want heaven, but I don't wanna change before then. I'm happy about going to heaven, but I'm going to be myself until I get there. Then you have not given your life to Christ then he's not your Lord. He's an idea. He's a belief system. He's a strategy to get to eternal life that might not get you there. I mean, there's this scripture that says that he's gonna look in a book and he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. But I prophesied in your name. I did the church dance during the song service. I said, yeah, but I didn't know you. You wore the right outfits. You even bought a leather back Bible. You spent $100 on it. But you never gave me your life. You couldn't even give me your language. You couldn't even give me your foul mouth. Let alone give me your life. You couldn't give up your anger. Let alone give up your life. And I think this is what confuses us. There's a verse in the Bible that confuses us, and it's Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, I have to change my voice because it just, it's so happy. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and butterflies and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And because I have all those things, watch, and against such, there is no law. There's no rules. Do whatever I want. Because I got the magic, get out of jail, free card, Holy Spirit. Those who belong to Christ have what? Crucify the flesh. You crucified your anger. You crucified your resentment. You crucified your bad behavior to possess 
the fruit of the Spirit. Now he says, since you live by the Spirit, and this is what we're suggesting that all Christians, because you're a Christian, you want to live by the Spirit. So since you live by the Spirit, then keep in step with the Spirit. And the, I, I, didn't, I didn't share this first service, but the idea behind what he's saying, keep in step, it's like a waltz. It's like the dance. You're not stepping on each other's toes. Keep in step, keep in tune, keep in rhythm with the Spirit. And then he says, but then don't go too far. Don't get conceited. Don't thank you all that. Provoking each other to envy. But this is, this is where we miss it. See, Pastor Mike, I told you, the Holy Spirit is producing fruit in my life. Okay. Okay. Seriously, straight out. Be self-aware. If I put a table out, a produce table, and I said, I want you to put out from your life the fruit of the Spirit that's in your life. Put it on this table. Put the fruit of the Spirit out. And I was a produce inspector. What's the condition of your fruit? What's the condition of your love? What's the condition of your joy? What's the condition of your peace and your kindness and your forbearance and your goodness and your faithfulness and your gentleness and your self-control? Is it in good, like, is the fruit of the Spirit in your life in such great condition that others want it? Or they say, no, I'm gonna pass on that one. It's got some dents and bruises. And that one's got some worms in it. <laughs> I'm just asking, if I had to say, take a self inventory of my love and of my joy and of my peace and my forbearance and my kindness and my goodness and my faithfulness and my gentleness so, oh, and self-control, how healthy is it? How healthy is it? So, so, so we can't use it as a scapegoat if we're not letting it be produced in our lives. The only way this fruit stays healthy is if we live by the Spirit. This fruit is produced, this fruit is healthy, this fruit grows if I live by the Spirit. And I can only live by the Spirit if I've crucified my flesh. To live by the Spirit, we daily have to get our flesh out of our spirit's way. I've seen around me lately at large, church at large, I talk to a lot of different pastors because I want to see, I, I, I would consider myself something the Bible talks as a watchman, okay, a watchman that sits on the wall, I'm watching what's happening in church world, trying to decipher, you know, end times and where we are according to the Bible and prophecy and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't get really weird with it, but I do consider myself a, 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 a watchman. And at large, church at large, what I've seen is during this time from March to now, when we've had more time on our hands than ever before, believe it or not, more opportunity to re reinvent ourselves into anything we want to be. I mean, we literally, we could totally start over. What I love about this moment is there's no big churches and small churches. It, the, the playing field is leveled. Everybody was online, right? What are you gonna do with this opportunity? And here's what I've seen. When the church was presented its biggest opportunity since Jesus Christ himself, I've seen the church, instead of advance, backslide. Let's just, at large, I'm not saying anybody in this room, but people at large, what have you produced since March? You know what we've produced? More binge watching of Netflix than ever before since its inception. Believe it or not. We've actually wasted more time because we've been so demotivated that we haven't actually done much. When you could have written a book, you could have written that book. You could have put all your recipes down on paper and put a book together. You could have made an online tutorial video of the thing that just burns within you. You could have taught somebody something that you know. I'm just throwing things out there. At large, we've actually done the biggest backslide instead of the biggest advancements. We're doing less 
and expecting more. And I'm not shaming anybody. I'm saying that this is a problem across Christianity at large. And Paul writes to us right here in Galatians 5.13, he says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. You can have that second piece of cake, but it ain't gonna help your diet. Come on. He's saying here, don't use the freedom to go back and be like the old self. Use it to be the better new self. But the only way you're gonna do that is if you purge your heart of its hurts, habits, and hangups. When you purge those things out, there is now room enough to love others. We can all day long stop behaviors that we don't want people to see. I was really great at this as a kid. I was like the perfect angel vocabulary wise when I was at home in front of my parents. I never once said a bad word in front of my parents as a kid. But the moment I got out with my friends, woo, all the bad words I had stored up the whole time I was at home just came flooding out of my mouth. As if you've never you judged, I feel the judgment so bad in this church this morning. <laughs> We're really good about taking that anger that's in there and suppressing it so that nobody sees it. We're really good at hiding stuff that we don't want people to see. But how much harder is it, instead of hiding it, to purge it? He said, I don't want you to hide it. I don't want you to just pretend you're not angry. I want you to get it out of your heart. You want to know really what's in your heart? Listen to your conversations. Listen to what you always find yourself talking about. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So if you're always speaking negative things, guess what? Your heart is full of negativity. Yeah, but didn't the Holy Spirit deal with that? No, the Holy Spirit did his work. The Holy Spirit purged your heart of stone, and gave you a heart of flesh. He, he brought you into a relationship with God. And I gotta tell you this, the Holy Spirit or God has done all the work he's going to do in your life. He gave you a pure heart connected to God. Now, what your responsibility to do is, man, I'm feeling that anger rise up in me again. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to deal with this. Help me to purge this because I don't want to keep feeling this way. Today, I want to take a few moments as we close out, about eight, eight or nine more minutes. And, and I, I see a lot of times pastors give sermons and point out problems and we feel all bad about ourselves, but they never give us any solutions. Today, I want to close out with some solutions to anger. Anger. Well, that's not me. I'm not an angry person. Just so you know, anger doesn't always manifest itself by screaming rage. Okay, just so you know. Anger can actually manifest itself as crying depression. Just, just so we all know. There, there, there's anger that we all deal with at some level, okay? Let me ask you this. Does it ever aggravate you that someone drives too close to the back of your car on the highway? Like, does that bother you? Just think about it. But why? But why? How? Like, just think about it for a second. Because those who deal with road rage, especially on 17 on a Sunday after church, <laughs> think about this for a second. How can the way someone else drives put me in a bad mood? It can't, it cannot. The way someone else drives on the highway cannot put you in a bad mood. You are choosing 
to be that person. You are choosing road rage over love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. You're choosing that. You're choosing to yell back at your spouse. Your spouse yelling at you can never make you feel anything. You are choosing to feel something based upon the words that they're saying. What's your name? Brooke. Brooke? Brooke, how does it make you feel that I'm about to tell you, Brooke, that that is the ugliest purple shirt I've ever seen in my life? How does that make you feel right now? So how does that make you feel? Confused. Huh? Confused. Confused. But it can't make you angry. It can't make you sad. You might be a little embarrassed because I said Brooke on live t TV and everybody hears you and looking at you right now, right? But it can't make you angry. It can't make you sad because your truth is I have a red shirt on and that dude is crazy because he just said that it's purple, right? Now, if you believed what I said, and you already felt today, you know, I feel kind of ugly about myself today. I wish I was pretty. I wish somebody loved me. And you walked in here today and said, that is the ugliest purple shirt I ever said. I knew it. I knew I'm ugly. I knew nobody loved me. Not because of what I said, but because of your definition of what I said. But because your truth is, this is a red shirt. This guy's an idiot. It can never make you feel anything. You can only feel what you put a definition to feeling. So when you get in an argument with your spouse and they push that button, they say that thing that you already believe about yourself. Yep. Now, anger comes up, emotion comes up, resentment comes up, because I'm gonna get you back. You hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you. I'm gonna tell you this, this is the thing that set me free when it came to dealing with anger within me. You are in control of your feelings, your circumstances are not. You are in control of your feelings, your circumstances are not. You are in control of the way you feel. You are in control of it. You are in control of continuing to be sad because you keep allowing yourself to keep thinking about the sad thing instead of changing the channel. Listen, my kid gets this. My seven-year-old gets it. When a show comes on the TV that he doesn't like, he changes the channel! But we say, I don't like this sad thought that's going through my mind. And instead of changing the mental channel, we just keep thinking about it over and over and over and over. I hate this show. I hate it. Will someone just change the channel? And God says, I've given you the power to change the channels in your life. There's nothing anyone can do to make you angry. There's nothing anyone can do to make you sad. There's nothing anyone can do to make you happy. You are choosing those feelings. It's all about the definitions that we give to our words. I don't have time to unpack that today. If you like this idea, we can do another one in a sermon later. But here's what I want you to know. If you are in control of how you feel, if you are in control of how you feel, then you can stop being angry right now. You can make a decision right now. That's it, I'm done being angry. I'm not gonna be an angry person, I'm done. And every time you feel that anger trying to come into your life, stop, stop it right now, done, I'm not doing it. Holy Spirit, I ask you to be the peace that surpasses all understanding. Your word says you'll keep me in perfect peace whose mind stays on you, anger go. All right, now listen, you don't gotta say that out loud and be weird. But set it in your head. Set it in your head. Nope, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And so when that person who really can push your buttons, you know what you do? The walk away. Oh, you don't know the power of the walk away? I do it all the time. 
I do the walk away when I'm buying a car. You didn't give me a deal I want? Thanks. Walk away. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> right? Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I, I do the walk away when I'm around negative people. People who just want to sit there and just talk negative and negative. I'm out. Wait, what, 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 what's he living for? I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this, man. I'm already negative. I'm negative enough for the whole church. I don't need to be around anybody else who's, who's, who's being negative. I'm out and a walk away because I got to purge that from my life and I got to produce positivity, good things in my life and so do you, okay? The Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. So we need to chase after these things. I don't have to be a nicer person. I don't have to be a happier person. I don't have to be a giggly person. I just have to stop being angry. There we go. This is how I talk to myself. I just say, stop being a jerk. Stop being a jerk. That's it. Just stop. Knock it off. You really know what the problem is? You're trying to get your own way. You, you're trying to manipulate somebody else to do what you want them to do. And because they're not giving you what you want, you're going to blow up so they can do whatever you want them to do. Listen, I'm going to help somebody else out. And I'm going to edit this later. It's for somebody in the room. Are we ready? Grow up. You were the kid screaming on the floor in the grocery store, kicking your feet when your mom should have gave you a bow bow. She laid down on the floor. Oh, Johnny, what's the matter, Johnny? Just stop being a jerk. That's it. And you know what ends up happening when you make a decision? That's it, I'm done. I'm not gonna be a jerk. I'm not gonna say things that hurt other people. All of a sudden, joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control begins to flow out of my life because I took control of what's coming out of my mouth. Woo! Purge it. You want to know what needs to come out of your mouth? The psalmist David says it so beautifully. The psalmist David becomes King David, the father of the wisest man, King Solomon. And he says this in Psalm 1914, may the words that come out of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God, are you proud of the words that are coming out of my mouth? God, are you proud of the meditations of my heart? Is God sitting back in heaven saying, that's my boy. You're killing it today. I love it. In order to live this way, we have to purge old mindsets, purge anger, and surround ourselves with positive people. Here's what I know. Negativity is contagious. So social distance yourself from negativity. Social distance yourself from negativity. Ah, stay six feet away. Stay six feet away. Keep your negativity away. I don't need that on me. I don't understand, I'm gonna close out with one more dig. I don't understand why someone has to make a negative comment instead of just unfollow me. Just unfollow me. Don't comment on me. Don't tear me down because your life is miserable. Come on. If, if you had a problem with something, just unfollow them so you don't have to see it. So it doesn't have to keep bothering you. Come on, somebody. And then say positivity, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control flow through me. Outside circumstances are not your problem. The internal transition to being a spirit follower is. That's the struggle. The struggle is between the flesh and the spirit. So my prayer for you today is that you would walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Father, we thank you today that your word will reside in our hearts, that it will build and grow and strengthen us each day. Father, I pray today that this word will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you said it for. Lord, I pray for a church full of believers 
who live according to your word and are happy and fulfilled because of it. I pray that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Holy Spirit, we ask you, help us to rebuild the church. Just as the psalmist David said, he would not give slumber to his head or, or rest to his eyes until he builds a house for the Lord. Help us to rebuild this house in your design, according to your image and your likeness, a church that you are well pleased with. We thank you, Lord, today that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend.